Before we get into the minors, I just wanted to show you this real quick. Um, I This was the deck that I was given, which is the U.S. Game Systems Green Box. Um, today, when I was literally getting ready to do the minor cards, I mean, this is what literally I was sitting down to do. I got, I went to the mailbox in the morning, and this came from Pisces Moon, which is the Aleister Crowley Thoth Tarot. It's the AGM Mueller uh, Swiss version. It has a copyright of 1944 and 1962, um, and this is that this that version of the deck, and it is a small size. Now I looked at a size as showing comparison, and it showed this, but it showed it as like a 3.75 inches high, where this one is actually uh, four and about four and a quarter inches high. So you can see, obviously the borders have been taken off of this, um, but you can see the difference in the size. And you can also, I just wanted to show you a couple, um, I'll zoom in a little bit closer. Um, they are very similar in terms of the artwork coloration except for the game system one is a little bit bolder and a little more contrast. Uh, so I just wanted to show you a couple of these so that you could see. I'm so excited to have this. I adore this. I love this. There's something very uh, with the the old, um, the worn kind of gold edges and uh, everything about it has a very um, mystical feel to it. Um, it feels like, it's like one that I want to put in my sacred space, so to speak, and use for that kind of thing. It has that kind of feel to me. Um, but I am very happy to, because I, I was literally going to order this. I had already decided last night that I was going to order another deck. So A, I had a smaller version for larger spreads, and that I had the Astrological Association, because you can see they will have Astrological, they will have Kabbalistic, and then sometimes uh, they will have elemental associations down there um, that I quite um, wanted to, to have and just have one with the borders. I will probably just leave this bordered uh, is my intention with this particular deck. So you know and for more for st like studying and learning and so I'm so excited that this came in it just I made my day because between the two of these I feel like I'm just ready to just sink into Thoth. Um, but you can see here, uh, there's just a, a more of a, a, a bolder contrast, a little bit of a darker, and a little bit of slightly bolder color uh, that you can, I, hopefully, I don't know if it will show up. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, there was one that I thought did a really good job. Uh, so you can just see, it's just a little, but otherwise, you know, I really like both of them. Um, you can definitely see it in the Hermit in it, it to the eye you can definitely see dark, richer purples here uh, I think in to the eye you can definitely also see it with the strength so they're I, pretty much identical except for again that uh, there's just a more contrast here and a bit of a richer color it's it's not huge uh, but it's definitely there you can see it my neighbor getting a ride again so I wanted to point that out before I went to on to the minors. Okay, now that we've gotten that kind of quick look at the difference between this particular deck and the uh, US Game System, quick look at that deck, I'm going to continue the minors on with this deck because um, we have the suit names and we have the keywords when we're getting into the other cards. So that would be, I think, interesting for us to take note of. Now, before we can even look at the rest of the suit, it's really important to look at the aces and the court card system with the Thoth. Um, this uh, book by Ducat, which is called Understanding Aleister Crowley's Thoth Thera, Thoth Tarot, sorry, I think has done a very good job of trying to succinctly explain these in a way that makes a lot of sense to me, not just with the Thoth Tarot, but I think this can apply to any tarot. And so I'm going to actually read this a little bit of this because it's 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 very short, this um, beginning part of, you know, he does the aces first, and I'm going to read what he says. Um, you may think it odd that he bring, begins with a quote from, from, 
uh, Crowley, but I'm going to start down here. You may think it odd that I began my examination of the 56 cards of the Minor Arcana by first examining the four aces instead of the court cards. After all, aren't the aces simply the first of the small cards? I hope I didn't hear anyone ask that question, he writes. To say the ace is just the lowest numbered tarot small card of its suit is like saying Cathar is just the first Sephira on the Tree of Life. Ultimately, there are not 56 cards in the Minor Arcana of the Tarot. There are only four, the four aces. The other 52 cards, the 16 court cards and the 36 small cards, live inside the four aces. So I just think that's fascinating. As we learned in Chapter 8, if we look at the ace of any suit under a magic microscope, we first see the four court cards of that suit living comfortably inside. But let's not stop there. If we increase the magnification level of our microscope, we see that the nine small cards of the suit are nestled neatly inside in three rows of three. Isn't that tidy? <laughs> what does Crowley mean when he tells us that the aces are not the elements themselves, but the seeds? of those elements. Kabbalistically, the most obvious answer deals with the fact that Kether, the first Sephora of the Tree of Life, is the inscrutable singularity of its particular world. As head honcho of the supernal triad, it is above and distinct from the other Sephiroth that actually do all the manifesting in and of their respective worlds. Isn't that explanation kind of a cop-out, however? It sounds as if I'm just trying to explain something that is impossible to understand by giving an example of something else that is impossible to understand. I didn't start to grasp, grasp this root of the elements concept until I learned that physicists cannot properly define the nature of matter. They go as far as to tell us that the components of atoms subatomic particles like protons, electrons, neutrons, and other strange things like quarks and charms and quark gluon plasma aren't matter at all but can only be described as non-material tendencies. What a perfect description of Kether. What a perfect description of the ace. It is that supremely fundamental tendency underlying a particular element. The ace of wands is not fire, but the tendency or grouping of tendencies to be fire and the suit of wands. That is amazing right there. What, this right here. It is the supremely fundamental tendency underlying a particular element. The ace of wands is not fire, but the tendency or grouping of tendencies to be fire and the suit of wands. I just think there's so much to chew on with that that makes complete sense as well as blowing my mind at the same time. So please excuse my having read all that. So so that's where we start to get the idea, understanding of the aces. And again, I can do an entire video on the aces, an entire video on the court cards, and probably will at some point. But I just wanted to kind of point that out. Because then, when, then he moves from the aces, uh, and it goes on to explain, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing, to be honest, and very interesting. Uh, but then we get to the court cards. So when we think about the aces of a suit, and remember we talked about, he read, read that where he talked about looking it under a microscope, and we first dial that microscope in to zoom in, we actually see within, say, the ace of swords, we see the four court cards living inside of this ace. And these represent the four elements, because all of the elements have incorporate all aspects of the other elements within themselves. And so for this, in this case, so we have the knights here as the fire, the queens as the water, the princes as the air, and the princesses as the earth. Um, in this suit. So this represents, uh, and people have asked me this question a lot about, you know, the elements of the court cards, and this is very clearly shown in the Thoth Tarot, and so if that is something that interests you, aka Patrick, um, you would be quite interested in this deck, aka Patrick, <laughs> because we have that understanding that the knight, who is in, is would be the king in the Rider-Waite-Smith, is 
the fire element of air. It's the fire energy that is found within air. The queen is the water energy found within air. The prince is the air division in air. That's most active because it's air, right? Air and air. And then the princesses are the earth element of air. And so uh, we have those four elements living within this particular uh, element. And then you go deeper and you start to go into the cards themselves. It's fascinating. Uh, it really is fascinating. But it's there's so much like it really can. Um, you can there's just so much that you can go into that I will have to be doing separate videos on them. So I'm just giving you this under basic nutshell, not even so much so that you can understand it, but so that you can see how much there is. Um, and it doesn't mean that this stuff doesn't exist in the Rider Waite Smith. It's just really uh, prominent within the thought uh, in terms of making it really make sense. Now it's important to understand that the princesses. So we have in this deck we have princesses, princes queens and knights which makes the the kings in the uh, Rider Waite Smith are much more established they're sitting on their thrones they're already ruling their country so to speak whereas in the Thoth the knights aka what would be the king so the knight the highest element is still very active they're all on horses they are in the midst of of pulling their uh, country or so to speak so together um, so it's a very different aspect. I really like, personally, I prefer, especially the princesses and the princes, and I do like the, the knights of swords um, versus the kings. It's quite interesting shift there. But it's important to understand that the princesses are the earth element of their suits, and they have a special relationship with their aces. They're kind of considered separately in terms of the court family. We have the court over here, almost like we have the cards for jacks and queens and kings, and they're considered separately uh, because they and the aces together rule the quadrants of space. So they rule the celestial aspect of their suit. So that's quite interesting to me. So the Ace and the Princess of Swords rules Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces and America. They also have it broken down into con countries and such. I'm not even going to go there. I haven't even started to wrap my mind around that. Then each Knight, Queen, and Prince rule 30% of the zodiacal year. So chauvinistic logic, it says, would suggest that the Knights would predominate in cardinal signs, Queens in the fixed signs, and Princes in the mutable signs. So, um, but, so that's the really bringing in astrology here, and we're going to get into that even more when we get into the, 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 the small cards, as they call them. Because the chauvinistic logic apparently is wrong. The Knights dominate the mutable signs, which are the flexible signs. Um, and the queens dominate the cardinal signs, which is quite interesting, uh, which is the active sign. And then the princes dominate the fixed signs. Uh, so very interesting and very mixed up. And I really like how this book, it, it's, it does a very good job saying, yep, this is confusing. So here are the mix-ups, mix-up, 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 and, and kind of tries to explain it in terms of how that it's making sense. And it, it does make sense. I just think you're going to have to read it or I'm going to have to read it multiple times. Uh, it's quite interesting to me. Um, so it gets really complicated, very interesting. You have to continue to kind of go through, I think, and re it's something to really work through. But I just wanted to give basically the understanding that we need to make sure that we understand that the princesses and the ace are very closely aligned and that they rule kind of the celestial aspect of the suit. I also wanted to make sure that we touched on the fact that aces that the aces are not the element. So the ace of wands is not fire, but the tendency or grouping of tendencies to be fire and the suit of wands. So I just think that's fascinating. And that the understanding also that the there aren't 
56 cards, there are four cards that are broke down into all of these. So inside of this ace is resides all of the cards uh, underneath. It's when you pile them up like this. And that shows, it confirms to the rest of the world, which everybody probably else knew this besides me. Uh, but I'm just saying, I, to me, aces are so important in a deck. And that's why. That's why. Because they represent the entire suit. And it's very... It's, uh, it's fascinating to me, and I'm babbling now, so I'm going to stop. I also just wanted to see a little bit of a breakdown here that we have princesses who rule the aces, and then we have the prince, the queen, and the knight, and also to understand the elemental, that these represent the elements within the element. So again, we have fire, water, air, and earth element of that particular element. <laughs> So there, uh, okay, let me put them actually back into order and put them here. Um, and then we'll stack these. I guess it doesn't really matter because I'm going to start to go a little bit quicker through these. I just wanted to make sure that we kind of got that very brief overview of what is very interesting um, and very complicated. There's one other thing that I do want to point out. Um, so let me go back here now to the minors. When we actually get to the minor arc, so we've looked at the aces. Um, when we actually get to the minor cards or the small cards, there is a very specific formula but then it gets complicated. But there is a very specific formula to these cards. The basic formula is the number of the suit. This is numerology is very important, and I can do again a whole nother video on that. Uh, the numer the number of the suit plus the planet that's in the zodiac sign, which I believe is reference. So here we have the moon in Libra, um, that equals the small card. Now there's lots of other things involved, but in a nutshell, uh, the core, core or the, the small cards are a formula of the numerological number plus the moon or the planet in the sign, and that's going to give us the understanding of the 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 suits and then it goes into this book goes into all kinds of charts reference and going into the decans and smaller and smaller and smaller and there's just all kinds of stuff going on um, so that we end up with uh, obviously an understanding of what's going on okay so that's what's important to know here is that these cards show us we have that it's a two of swords we also see two swords and then we see here that the moon is in libra so in the actual image we see the astrological correspondence so in order to understand this card we need to understand the number two and we need to understand the what it means to have the moon in Libra. If we understand both those things, it should come up with something relatively close to this understanding of peace. Now, the Golden Dawn model apparently had two hands. So I let me just show you how this does the minors. It shows you the picture of the card. This is the book, again, by Ducat, Understanding Aleister Crowley's Toth Tarot, Toth Tarot. We have Moon in Libra. We have the deck and it's zero degrees to ten degrees in Libra. We have the date, September 23rd to October 2nd. We have the original title, which was Lord of Peace Restored. It tells us what the Golden Dawn model was, which was two hands appear from clouds at the right and the left side holding two swords. That was the Golden Dawn that people would make their decks from. The swords cross in the center of the card. A red rose with five petals blooms where the swords touch. We see right here it's not red, though. Um, and then the rose emits white rays. Um, that's what the original looked like. Uh, the print scale it tells that. It tells the color, which should be pearl blue, pearl gray, like the mother of pearl. We have the four scales, which are for... Um, the moon are blue, silver, cold. It's all, I mean, so much detail. So the formula is, and so then they write out the formula. Two, which is chakma in, obviously, the Kabbalah of swords, which is yet Zara, plus moon in Libra equals peace. 
So then he goes on to explain, astrologers, astrologers tell us that people who were born with moon and Libra criticize and make judgments from a position of enviable equilibrium. They weigh every problem and preposition with the utmost fairness. This fortunate union of sign and planet find a predictable, dignified home in Chakma. The result is one of the few cards in the suit of swords that doesn't evoke groans when it appears in a tarot reading. That's not to say it's all goodness and light. Uh, we must remember that the natural vocation of a sword is to fight, to cut, to pierce, to kill. It's an instrument of action just like the mind, just like the ruach, the intellectual part of the soul. It is in constant movement. So that's what's interesting. Eastern mystics, it says, tell us that the mind is the great enemy. If we are to achieve profound levels of consciousness, the mind must be overcome. Fearful that it, its existence and control will end, the mind resists these efforts at all costs. That's why there are so many cards in the suit of swords seem frustrated, anxious, nervous, and even tortured. In the case of the two of swords piece, it seems we've dodged a bullet. We must always remember, however, that for the sharp and dangerous sword, peace is just an uncaring characteristic and temporary interruption from war. <laughs> so that is quite interesting. And then there's a whole nother section. So then he does give you a divinatory meaning for the two of swords, a quarrel made up, yet still some tension in relations, actions sometimes selfish, sometimes unselfish, contradictory characters in the same nature, strength through suffering, pleasure after pain, sacrifice in trouble, yet strength arising, arrangement, peace restored, truce, truth, truth and untrue, sorrow and sympathy, and so on and so forth. There's just so much information. There's so much information. I just wanted to give you that example of, this particular book because I really do think I highly recommend after what I've done so far with these books I highly recommend understanding Aleister Crowley's Thoth Tarot and then I also so let's take a look here you know, a general meaning is a state of balance relaxation serenity thoughtfulness fairness and compromise um, Two cross swords putting down the weapons, the blue five leaf rose blossom, mercy, appeasement, and peace, the geometric patterns about equilibrium and harmonious order. Then we have two small swords with the moon uh, and symbol of Libras, again about balance. The green yellow of the background is ambivalence. And then the number and the element is two, the element, the number is two, which is reconciliatory. And then the thoughts are air. So we're having, you know, the mind being reconciled. And then we also have the astrology noted here of the moon in Libra as in a balanced and peaceful Libra. Feelings with the moon need the feelings and need the mood for harmony in Libra. And so there's quite a lot. Uh, this really just takes all of the craziness of details of this and condenses it down just so that you can at least kind of, and sometimes it helps to start with this and get a grasp in your brain and then see it expanded outwards in the book itself. And then you can expand it further into the book of Thoth. So just as a, you know, a, a recapping, since we've just touched on all that stuff, let me zoom this out for a minute. I know I'm, I'm kind of going crazy how I'm doing this. But just as a recapping, since you know we've looked at the aces, we've looked at the court cards, we've looked at an example of how to look at the two of swords. And so what we're basically seeing in terms of books are these three books. We have this very condensed, uh, giving us the basic information worked out. Uh, I love how they've done this. That gives us sort of the nuts and bolts. Then if we go to the, then if we go to understanding Aleister Crowley's, we've expanded out even more. So we've expanded and got more and more information, quite a lot of information. And then the next step is expanding fully out with the actual Book of Thoth, where he kind of rambles on and talks about all of this. So that's why I really find that these three, for me, and again, these are the ones I have experience with. So these three to me together are kind of, uh, I, I think, uh, what I would recommend that you go with. And if you only were going to pick two, to be honest, I would say take these two and kind of get a really good foundation before going with this uh, because this is more convoluted. But um, so if you were only going to get two, if you were only going to get one, I would probably say this, even though my literature self says to take this. But if you're only going to take one, I would probably say to take the um, Ducat book. If you're going to take two, I would take these. If you're going to take three, I would take all three of these. So 
that's my personal recommendation as of right now. And again, um, that's just my personal experience. So take that for what it's worth. So now we are going to stop with all of that and just kind of run through the cards so that you can see them. And most of these are pip cards. So, you know, you know, it's, it's but they, uh, they have emotion in the pips, which is what's so amazing. So let's just take a quick through run through now. So here we have the Ace of Swords, the gorgeous Two of Swords. I love the sword suit. The Three of Swords as Sorrow, and you can just see it in the coloration. And again, if you go through this, I mean, it goes through all what these particular colors mean. Um, that color is so important, and it gives you that emotion uh, that we need to know that's going to help to explain the energy of the card. So these are pip cards, but they are not... Uh, pip cards like, say, the Marseille, where you're really pretty much strictly getting, let's say, two swords, three swords, four swords. Um, this has a layers of meaning, even though it's not a scene like uh, the Rider Waite Smith. There is so much there to give you information about what it means. Once you know the code, it's going to be very easy in a way to crack that code and to understand it. So here we have the four, and we can see in all the cards what, again, the formula is the number four and what that means and then here we have Jupiter in Libra and so when we go to our book I know I said I wouldn't do this but we have Jupiter in Libra so Jupiter is faith and hope for peace and justice uh, that's what that kind of the number four I'm sorry we've got <clears throat> start fresh so we have the number four, which is inflexibility or also stability um, in air. So that's our first thing we look at. And then we're looking at Jupiter, which is about faith and hope is what they have it for, for peace and justice in Libra. And so we get a truce uh, that is being made. There's a standstill of the fight from the number four and in the mind, so there is a stability, a stabilizing effect in the battle. And there is some hope that's being in Jupiter for peace and for justice being served. Um, and that is what equates for this keyword as being tr a truce. It's just amazing. It's amazing. So here uh, we have the Five of Swords. And again, just I'm just going to do this on a couple so you can see. So they have number five as being kind of a critical or a crisis point uh, in the mind, in perception. So a cri critical perception. And we have an in willful, unpredictable, frosty of Aquarius that is in, I'm sorry, that is is Venus in Aquarius, so in a relationship. So a willful, unpredictable, frosty uh, conduct in a relationship is how they are doing Venus in Aquarius. And that is equaling a defeat. So I think it's amazing. It, 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 my, it blows my mind. <laughs> it truthfully does. <laughs> Literally excites my mind and blows my mind at the same time. Uh, so here we have Mercury in Aquarius. So they all have their signs there and then they have their numbers there. Um, so we have these sixes as a, as a combination that's going on. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop because I literally this could take forever. But uh, let me just again reiterate that be between the numbers and their element, which is this, you know, the swords all together, as well as the planet in the sign, and then on top of that, the coloration, the colors in the card. And then we get any of the images that we might get. It it really does have so much to say. It's not a pip card, um, like a Marseille deck would be much more of a pip card. And so uh, this is something that's different than that. Uh, so I think it's just amazing. So here we have the seven of swords, the eight, and I'm you know going to go relatively quickly because in terms of images they are pips although they're not <laughs> I just wish it would just take me forever I really need to do like a suit by suit uh, video on this uh, it's got me so revved up and excited I literally you know I want to do a video on the aces a video on the court cards a video on the um, each of the suits of the minors you know and so on and so forth <sighs> So here we have the Nine of Swords, which I think is absolutely gorgeous. 
the Ten of Swords. Then we have the Princess who rules the suit in a way. He rules the Ace. The Prince, who I think are always in chariots. The Queen. Beautiful. And then the Knight of Swords, which we would know it at, from Red White Smith as the King, um, which is the fire element. I love this Ace of Discs. I think it's stunning. The Two of Discs. The Three of Discs. I love this as well. It looks so stabilized, doesn't it? It's like Earth. It's the stabilizing four of Earth. It's just such a stable thing there. <laughs> the Five of Discs. The Six of Discs. The Seven of Discs. Look at the coloration. You can just see uh, failure there. The Eight of Discs. The Nine of Discs and the Ten of Discs. The Princess. The Prince, yep, there's his chariot. The Queen, very powerful Queen of Discs. And the Knight of Discs, who's not on, well, he is on his horse, but they're not riding. So you can see that kind of stabilized, slower energy. Here we have the Ace of Wands. The Two of Wands, the Three of Wands, the Four, I don't know why you can see them, but the Five, the Six, it looks victorious, the Seven, which has similar to the Sixes with the, the same heads, but then we have this Victoria, this other wand in the middle that's going to tell us something, the Eight, moving in all directions, the nine, the ten of wands, and then we have, um, and we can see we had the energy of the eights in a way, right? But it's being oppressed by and pressed down by these other ones. The princess, I love, I think she's, so, she's got a very strange head thing, the hair thing going on, but it's pretty cool. The prince of wands in his chariot. The Queen of Wands and the Knight of Wands. Then we have the Cups with the Ace of Cups, the Two of Cups, the Three of Cups, the Four of Cups, the Five of Cups, the Six of Cups. The Seven of Cups getting murky there. <laughs> the Eight of Cups definitely getting murky. Then moving to resolving that to the Nine of Cups and then the Ten of Cups all as well. <laughs> here we have the Prince of Cups with his chariot with this cool bird here. I love the Prince. Of, oh, I mixed them up. The Princess of Cups I love. Oops. The Prince of Cups, then the Queen of Cups, who is quite beautiful, and the Knight of Cups, which is also quite gorgeous and very Holy Grail-ish. Uh, so there we have all, a very quick, and again, I could have spent so much time on every single one, even in the minors. Okay, so now we have worked our way through the entire um, of the decks, and... You can see, I'm just, I'm just literally, again, excited, and then at the same time, mind blown uh, by this deck. Let me say that this deck here, which is this version, again, it's AGM Mueller, and it has a 1944 and 1966 copyright from Switzerland. I love this cardstock just in terms of usability. It's not like it's fancy. It feels like a really good playing card. And I like playing cards, so that to me is not a denigration. Um, I like playing cards. I like shuffling playing cards. And it has a really beautiful playing card, smooth. They, I didn't get a good bridge there. 
I didn't get a good bridge there, but it bridges beautifully. Um, it just feels fantastic to shuffle just in terms of, of rifle shuffling. So for a hands-on deck, um, this just, just shuffle. I love this cardstock. Um, it's a little bit of gloss, but it's not a high gloss. It feels like a sort of, I don't know, they just they slip beautifully. It's very slippy. Um, and so this is great, uh, just in terms of cardstock. I don't know how available this is even. Uh, Pisces Moon, who sent this to me, has, has she said it was sitting on her shelf for the last 10 years. So I don't even know if this is something that you can purchase new. I'm assuming probably not. Uh, so I'm probably just telling you this just for no good to you whatsoever. This is the... Um, U.S. game system, and this has been trimmed down, obviously. Uh, it also has a great shuffle to it. I really like this, um, and it, it, trimmed or untrimmed, because a lot of times when you trim decks, you don't get this great shuffle, and you get a really good shuffle with this, and this is all trimmed down, you know, of all the edges, so it's quite a bit smaller than it started, um, and it shuffles beautifully. So I personally like both of these uh, for shuffling. They both, and they're just... I, I think you need one of each. I think you need to get a large U.S. game system to trim down so that you have the images in all of their glory um, in a large size. And then I also think you need a small one for just portability. You could also trim this down. I've seen people trim it down and leave the bottom uh, and take, even take some of this off here. Uh, various ways I've seen this trimmed. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. Most likely I'm gonna just leave it as is. That's my intention. Um, I just like it how it is. They're quite busy cards anyways. And so I think sometimes having, I, I was upset with my Paulina when I trimmed the white off because I felt like it, um, it actually made them too busy, and I, I liked the separation with the Paulina. And I feel like this might be the same thing uh, in terms of the smaller image. Um, like this, it's absolutely stunning, and see, I have that. So that makes me less needy. I don't feel the need to trim this down because I have this gorgeous, um, large, uh, trimmed version, and so I don't really feel the necessity. I want to keep this whole for learning and that kind of thing and studying and just, again, for, for spreads in which I'm doing a larger spread, that kind of thing. So I'm thrilled to have both of these, and I would recommend that to people learning. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, easy to say because I was gifted both of these. So I, I understand that aspect. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and do a reading on this because um, I this I know even as a second part is already long. Um, I will, um, look at this. I mean, it's so stunning. It's just, I'm in love with it. I don't, this is the only image in the deck really that I'm just not all that fond of. And it keeps, of course, popping up to harass me. Um, it's just beautiful. The pip cards are not pip cards in my opinion and they're absolutely stunning. Uh, so there you go. This has been a look I've tried. This was, you know, ugh, like I said, I can do uh, a video alone on each of those different segments and spend a lot of time on this deck. Um, so be forewarned, there probably will be. You can just move on. Although truthfully, again, I think even just diving into all this kind of elemental, astrological, Kabbalistic stuff, information is part of the gold it's tied to the golden dawn which is where the rider weight smith came out of and where both of these decks came out of so information that you learn about what i'm talking about in terms of the elements and the astrological correlations and the the recipe of having you know the number plus the sign you know plus the planet in the sign uh and plus the element making up what the suits that all applies to you know uh, all of, of both Rider Waite Smith and Thoth, they've just kind of apply went about applying them in different ways. And so um, so I, I don't think even if you don't intend on working with a Thoth, I don't think there is uh, anything to be lost by learning about what the Thoth has to offer uh, to really solidify those kind of ideas that will translate, I think, and enhance uh, even if you never use the Thoth Tarot to read with. So there we have it. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. I will be doing uh, testing this out with some readings for sure. And uh, so I will get back to you on that.
that, that would pr that will probably be the actual next uh, video that I would do with the Thoth, just to give it a whirl, kind of break it in and see what we see. <laughs> so there we have it. Thanks for watching.